All right, we're going to move on to our second point. And our second point is faith that works is manifested in wisdom. Not only is it manifested in the way we speak, but it's also manifested in what we do. So for the next six verses, our attention is turned from what a person says to what they actually do. Now, many people wanted to teach in the early church, and many people covet the teaching position today. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to teach others. But some weren't saved, and those that were saved, many of them had areas in their lives that contradicted their message. And there's nothing worse than that. For those of you who attended the Titus classes I did a couple of years ago, you'll remember that the the leading theme for Titus was to put God on display in your life. In other words, when we go out and preach the gospel to a fallen world, and we tell them, what? that God wants to save them from their sins, we need to prove to them with our own life that He saved us from ours. Right? There's no point telling someone God wants to save you from your sin if our own life is still filled with sin. They're not going to believe a word you say. And that's why it's important as believers that we walk the talk. And essentially the next section is all about walking the talk. It's not enough to have good doctrine in your head. You need to have good doctrine worked out in your life as well. And that's where the challenge really lays. But it is possible, with the Lord's help, to change any area of your life. It's interesting, uh, one of the popular things that people like to say today is, you need to love me for who I am. Right? You hear that all the time, don't you? Whenever you point out an error in somebody else's life, they go, well, you're meant to love me unconditionally. You're meant to love me the way I am. Well, it is true we're meant to love each other the way we are. But on the other hand, if you truly love the Lord Jesus, you won't stay the way you are. All right? That's the reality of it. And we can work to deal with certain areas of our lives. And we do that by yielding control to the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And submitting ourselves under His Lordship daily, uh, hourly, even moment by moment. And as we do that, we find ourselves obeying the law. Even without even thinking about it. Have you ever thought about that? That's what the book of Galatians is talking about. When the book of Galatians says, you know, we're no longer under the law. We don't need a strict rule because when we're walking under the control of the Holy Spirit, following the Lord Jesus Christ, you naturally simply obey the law, right? Because you're doing what Jesus would do, and He always obeyed the law. And it's that simple. Walking in the Spirit is simply following Jesus. And as you follow the Lord Jesus, under the control of the Holy Spirit, you obey the law. You do. It's impossible to sin when the Holy Spirit is in control, folks. If sin happens in your life, it's because you took control back, all right? It's that simple. I remember years ago when I first came to CCF, Pastor Peter asked me, what is your sin? What's the sin in your life that keeps tripping you up? Now, there were any number I could have chosen from, but the one that, I, I, that really had my attention at that time was my speech, because my wife is a very, very gentle soul, a uh, very, very gentle person, and I wasn't. I was a very, very hard person, a very harsh person, and it was very, very difficult for her and for me because I would say things that in the environment that I was used to wouldn't cause any offense at all, but for her... She would take offense at it, and it would hurt her a lot. So I had to learn, and I said to Pastor Peter, I need to be more gentle. I need your help to grow in gentleness. So he prayed for me, and and I prayed about it, and we trusted the Lord together. And you can ask my wife after if the Lord answered my prayer. And uh, the truth is, yes, he did. And today, my wife and I have a much better relationship because of it. And I'm not as harsh. But I tell you now, remember the illustration with the lion? If I do not walk in the Spirit, and I allow my old nature to gain control, I can go straight back to what I used to be. Just like that. Just like that, in an instant. No delay whatsoever. And my wife knows when I'm walking in the Spirit and when I'm not. Simply by how I talk. So friends, this is important. 
Change is possible. You can grow in these areas. You don't have to live under slavery to sin. That's the message of Romans 6. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are now slaves to righteousness. But this only happens in our lives when we yield ourselves to God's control. James does not have the Greek idea of wisdom here. And this is very important, okay? This is very important to understand. That was based in theory and speculation. Greek wisdom was all about philosophy. It was all about thinking about ideas of human wisdom, coming up with speculations, coming up with theories, and this dominates the Western education system. And of course, by uh, default and follow-on, it also dominates the education system here. You guys follow the West, right? Pretty much when it comes to a lot of these things, even though you have your own culture and your own ideas, a lot of the education that you're following on with comes from the West. And it's important to understand that education today is dominated by the Greek idea of wisdom. Theory, speculation, it's all in your head. And this is not what James had in mind. To the Hebrew, wisdom, whenever you see the word wisdom used in the Bible, it's talking about truth that is applied to your life and lived out in your life. In other words, the wise person isn't the one that knows a lot of stuff. The wise person is the one that lives what he knows. That's the wise person. My grandmother on my mother's side was a, was a godly woman. I would have never been able to have a conversation with her about theology and the things that I, I understand and the things I love to debate and talk about. Uh, she could have never engaged me at that level when it comes to talking about the scriptures. But the one thing that I always remember about her was her godly life, the selfless way that she lived. The way that she sent money from her pension for years to the mission field to make sure that my parents were supported as missionaries and refusing to buy herself shoes so that when we came back from the mission field, my parents had to take us straight out and buy her new shoes. She would do anything for anyone. She lived out what she knew. Did she know a lot about theology? No, no, and near as much as I know. Could she define in terms that I can certain theological truths? No. But what she knew and what she understood, she lived. That's wisdom. That's what James is talking about. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. What's James saying here? You claim to be wise? You claim to have understanding? Do you comprehend these truths? Prove it with your life. That's what James is saying. We could say, do you understand session one tonight? Do you understand what we talked about when we talked about the tongue? Well, now you have the rest of your life to what? Prove it. Put it into action. Show the Lord and show yourself and show your family and your friends and everyone around you that you're wise. And live it out in your life. Do you get the difference? On the one hand, we're talking about knowledge accumulated, speculation, theory, philosophy. On the other hand, we're talking about knowledge lived out in the life. And if you want to be a teacher, you'd better have a lot of knowledge up here, and it had better be worked out in your daily life as well. It's not just a matter of what you know. Wisdom is what you do. And you'll see this time and time again. Just read the book of Proverbs. The wise man does what? Controls his speech. The wise man doesn't run off with women who play the harlot. The wise man doesn't do silly things like that. The wise man listens to his parents. These are things that Proverbs talks about. Always the wisdom is applied. Always the wisdom is lived out. 
So James is asking, who among you understands the Word of God? And are these principles clearly seen in your daily life? Oftentimes we're continually looking for new information. But sometimes the information we have isn't being lived out. I'll never forget my first term in Bible school. I went to a very unique Bible school. Um, it's not accredited. I didn't get a degree. They were far more concerned about my walk with the Lord and whether or not things were being put into practice in my life than they were about my grades. I'm thankful I went to that kind of a Bible school. I am. I learned many valuable lessons. And having gone there and learned that way, I'll never forget the end of my first term. When I first went there, I just wanted an A in every subject. That was my goal. I'd never gotten an A in anything in my life, okay? Oh, that's not true. I got an A in reading and an F in maths because I read during maths. So I remember that. My dad actually promised me $100 per A, and he never had to cough up a single dime, not one. I mean, I, I, I was just terrible at it. it. School bored me, to be honest with you. I was so bored with the subjects. But when I got saved and I came to know the Lord Jesus, man, I fell in love with the Bible. And when I went to Bible school, I just wanted to pass every subject. I'll never forget church history. I think I shocked uh, the lecturer a little bit. It was kind of funny because I had to write a paper on church history, and I wrote a paper on the Reformation. I believe it was meant to be just three or four pages. I wrote 50 sides. <laughs> Consequently, a couple of years later, I came back as a visiting professor. <laughs> And I taught the subject. But it's really, really funny when you think about it. I mean, I really put in so much effort in these things. But I'll never forget, at the end of term one, I wasn't thinking about passing with A's anymore. I was thinking about surviving the course. <laughs> Simply be not because of the knowledge, but because I was learning so many new things, and they weren't being lived out in my life. And it was crushing me. I literally lived every day. I was miserable because all this new light was being shed on my life and I couldn't live it. And I struggled. I struggled terribly. Fortunately, I had godly men around me to point me in the right direction. I'll never forget, I, I had many, many A's in, uh, in, in my, uh, during my time there. I'll never forget one teacher who had the audacity to mark me with a B-. minus. And, uh, and I, was, I went into his office. I was so filled with pride. I went into his office. And I said, how dare you give me a B minus? This is an A plus paper. I sent it to my dad. You know, I've sent it to other good Bible teachers. And I did. I sent it to other people to get them to look at it. And uh, they all agreed it was an A plus paper. Do you know what he said to me? Dear old man, other than cut your hair, which was the other thing he said to me. He said, Jonathan, there's nothing wrong with the theology you've written down. But I was watching you play volleyball the other night. And I realized you don't understand this at all. How would you like a teacher like that? You know what? I thank God for that man. I do. I didn't then. I do now. I thank God for that man. He taught me a very important life lesson. Wisdom is not what's in here. Wisdom is the knowledge that's in here that's able to make the journey to your heart and is lived out in your life. That's wisdom. These are important things to learn. It's not just about what we know. It's about what we do. It's about how we live. This is wisdom. If you want to be a teacher of God's Word, your doctrine had better be right, but your life had better match your doctrine. There's no point standing up here and pontificating to everybody else and not living it. Sooner or later, it will catch up with you. You claim to be wise, James says. Let's take a look at your life. Prove to me you have true wisdom, the kind that only comes from God. In verse 13, James targets three areas of our lives where divine wisdom would show up. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by what? His good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of wisdom. So what we have here is three categories. 
Firstly, we have our daily life. The first is your good behavior, or the general way that you live your life on a daily basis. You can break it down into three basic areas. You've got your family life, you've got your working life, and you have your recreational life, don't you? And James is asking, how is the wisdom of God lived out in these categories of life? Your family life. What's it like at home? You all look very nice and polished and well-to-do from where I'm standing right here. But if I was to come home with you and, and sit like a fly on the wall for a couple of days, what would I think? What goes on behind closed doors? What about your working life? When everybody else is around the water cooler, as they say, tearing each other apart, ripping your boss to shreds with horrible words, are you there participating? What about your recreational life? When all you ladies are meeting for coffee at Starbucks, who are you tearing down? Who are you ripping apart? You know what I'm talking about, right? Wait for chapter 4. <laughs> Friends, guys, we're just the same. Do you remember when we used to stand there and rate girls from 1 to 10? How degrading. These things hit us where we really live, don't they? These are important things. Does our general life, our good behavior, does it show the wisdom of God? The reality is not all the time. But we can do a lot better than we do. Secondly, your works. Now here, it's talking about specific deeds that you do. As we go about daily life, opportunities will open up to do specific things, right? Not just things that generally follow the everyday course of life, but good works, specific deeds. And you have opportunities to apply the wisdom of God and bring Him glory. What about opportunities to help out a brother or sister in Christ? We studied that in our earlier lessons, didn't we? If the Lord brings a, a brother or sister in Christ who is in need across your path, and you have the opportunity to help them, that's an opportunity right there and then to apply the wisdom of God and say, God will meet my needs, so I'm going to meet His. Opportunities to serve in various ministries. We're always asking for people to help. The reality is, on Sunday morning, thousands of people come in and out of this building. And yet, even though thousands come in and out of this building, we still can't get hundreds to serve. There's a problem there. There's a disconnect between what they're hearing and what they're living. It happens all the time. And it's wrong. And James is saying, there are opportunities in life to live out the wisdom that you're learning. What about opportunities to share the gospel? I'll never forget when I was in Australia. I was in missionary training, training how to be a missionary. All right? I was doing cross-cultural communication and how to preach the gospel cross-culturally. I was doing Bible translation and how to translate the scriptures into another language. And... and, and these were interesting studies, and I really enjoyed them. The ultimate goal, though, was to get me to the mission field where I would be bringing other people to Christ. Hopefully, that was the goal. Share God's Word with them. One evening, after a particularly hard day, I was at a, a local um, sports club. And I was lying there in the pool, and I was just relaxing in the pool. And it's just a tiny little pool, and there's a sauna right beside it where you can go in and relax. And... And I, I used to be quite fit back then. I, I used to do three aerobics classes back to back. I used to run everywhere and uh, all sorts of things. I mean, I was really skinny. Now, I know you don't believe me, but uh, you, you can check Facebook for the proof, okay? And uh, literally, I used to do it all the time. I was really tired. I'd been working in the hot sun, and I'd been just done a whole bunch of aerobics classes. I was really tired. So I'm lying there in the pool, and uh, I'm just praying. I'm saying, Lord, you know, I really want to use what I'm learning. Give me an opportunity. And a guy keeps interrupting me while I was praying, and I was getting really annoyed with him. I was like, you know, why does this guy keep bugging me? He kept trying to start up a conversation, and, and I would like, oh, yeah, okay. And then I would carry on praying, and, Lord, I really want an opportunity. And then uh, he got up and went into the sauna, and then suddenly I woke up and went, 
what is wrong with you? You know, there's an opportunity right here. God brought someone right to me, and I wasn't even awake enough to understand. I got up, went into the sauna, sat down beside him, and I got to talk with him for an hour. Turned out he was a backslidden Christian, and he wanted a Bible, and, and we, had a, we had an awesome time talking about the Lord. Now, here I am, praying for an opportunity that I am denying when the Lord brings it across my path. Friends, we have opportunities many times throughout our lives to do good deeds. Good deeds that put God's wisdom into practice and live it out in our lives. And we don't do it. God brings us someone and we're so nervous he won't even talk to them. Friends, there are so many opportunities. I had a guy who belongs to a, to a cult here in the Philippines. I was just sat in Starbucks and just reading my Bible. And he came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, are you a pastor? And, and I said, yeah, I work at a, a local church here and, and I teach the Bible. And he says, oh, I've got some questions. We spent two hours talking about doctrine. Obviously, he was roped into a group that uh, taught him a false gospel. So I got an opportunity to share with him the right gospel for two hours. Opportunities are everywhere if you look for them. The problem is, we're so selfish. Oftentimes, we miss these opportunities. Thirdly, it's our attitude. God's wisdom will manifest itself in an attitude of gentleness or humility. The Greek word was used to refer to a horse that had been broken, or gentled, if you like. This is not weakness, but strength under control. It was said of Moses that he was a very meek man, but Moses was a warrior. Moses was a prince of Egypt. Moses was a man who was trained to defend himself. Moses was a very strong man and a very strong leader, yet he was called meek. Strength under control. The truly wise person lives a life that demonstrates humility and gentleness. It doesn't retaliate, but it isn't weak either. Look at Jesus. Would you say he was weak? No, he was strong, so strong, but he didn't retaliate. He didn't lash out. He gently bore whatever came his way and in humility set the example for us to follow. Folks, our attitude is important. It's not just our general life and the way we live. It's not just our specific good works that God gives us the opportunity to do. It's also the attitude in which we do them in. Do we show an attitude of humility and gentleness? It's a life lived under the control of the Holy Spirit and therefore produces the fruit of the Spirit. That's the only way the fruit of the Spirit is produced. We need to abide in the vine, right? And as we abide in the vine... The Holy Spirit takes control and produces fruit in our lives. Galatians tells us this, but the fruit of the Spirit, if the Spirit is in control, what will be seen in our lives? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know when God is in control in your life because these are the things that will be seen. And you know when you're in control of your life because there will be a whole different set of fruit that will be present. The remaining verses of the chapter contrast the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God and ask us which kind of wisdom we have. Divine wisdom is yet another evidence that our faith is real and we've truly been born from above. In other words, the, the question that's underlying everything is, who are you? Are you a child of God or are you a child of the devil? Do you have dead faith or do you have living faith? Do you possess divine wisdom or the wisdom of the world? And over and over again, James is asking these questions. He's saying, if your faith is real, it should be seen in the way that you live your life. It should be seen in the way that you handle trials. It should be seen in the way that you handle temptations. It should be seen in the way that you respond to the truth. It should be seen in the way that you love others. It should be seen in the good works that should multiply out of your life 
It should be seen in the way that you speak. And it should be seen in the wisdom that is displayed in the life that you live. If you truly are God's and you have been born again and you are living this new life in Christ, there will be some evidence. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. What's James saying here? The motive behind worldly wisdom. That's what James is talking about. Where a heart is where our motives dwell, right? That's where the motive is. That's what drives us. In other words, the mouth speaks what Jesus said, the heart is full of. Isn't that what Jesus said? The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So, while the tongue may be getting a lot of attention right now, the reality is, it all begins in the heart. And the question being asked here is, what drives you? Are you being driven by your new nature? Or are you being driven by the sinful nature? Because the fruit will determine which one you're being driven by. Is it a desire to love God and keep His commands? Or do we live to love ourselves and follow our own desires? These are the two paths. I just wanted to take a second and take you back to Ecclesiastes. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. But to be honest, he did some of the stupidest things that man has ever done as well. And even though he was incredibly wise, he was actually incredibly foolish. I'm sorry to pick on the ladies a lot tonight, but he was led astray by the women in his life. He wasn't happy with just one woman. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's a lot of women in your life, right? Now, men, you know how hard it is to satisfy one woman, all right? We're talking about a thousand. I mean... It probably drove him nuts. Let's be, fa let's be honest here. It was hard. 700 wives. 300 sexual partners. In addition to the wives. There were only two reasons to have a concubine. Either for sex or to have children. Now he had 700 wives, so I can't think the children was an issue. Alright? The bottom line is, he didn't deny himself very much, did he? And that these women, later on in life, led him away from God. To the point where he even built altars for their false gods. That's how far astray he ended up. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2, he outlines really the stupidity, the folly, the silliness of human wisdom. He started off by educating himself. And he educated himself about education and about folly, madness. In other words, he turned his mind to study what people would consider educational material. But at the same time, he turned his mind to study madness as well. And stupidity and foolishness and what he calls folly. He didn't find any satisfaction in knowledge. So after a while, he tried pleasure. And he tried pleasure. Anything that brought him pleasure. He denied himself nothing. But this didn't work either. There was still no satisfaction in this. So he turned to substance abuse. In particular, alcohol. And he tried with alcohol to fill this gaping hole inside that he wasn't able to fill with pleasure and education. But it didn't, well, it didn't take long for him to realize that alcohol is not an answer to any problem. So he did what a lot of young men do. He cleaned up his act and went into business. Right? And he thought business would bring satisfaction. The problem is, it didn't take long in business for him to figure out that there was no satisfaction there either. So he did what many people do today. He joined the Green Party and he turned to nature. All right? Hugged a tree. Built a park. Took up recycling. Nothing wrong with these things, but at the end of the day, they're no substitute for a relationship with God, are they? 
After that failed, he decided to go for power. He brought many people under his control. That didn't work, so he tried wealth, and he accumulated enormous amounts of money. This didn't work, so he decided to try and satisfy himself with music and entertainment. And he decided to just tune the world out, just like so many people do today. This didn't work, so he tried sex. Denied himself absolutely nothing. What was his conclusion after all these things? The end result was that he hated his life, and he was upset that all he had acquired would go to someone that hadn't earned it and would probably misuse it after he died. He was a bitter old man. After having everything people say would make you happy. Oh, if only I had more money. It would solve all my problems. Really? There's a lot of rich people out there with a lot of problems. Did you know that? Suicide rate among millionaires is pretty high. There's a lot of rock stars and movie stars. Their lives are littered with broken relationships. They can't keep a man or a woman in their life. They're so selfish. Nobody wants to be with them very long. Once the initial excitement wears off, pretty soon, it's a divorce. They have money to buy anything they want. And yet they're as miserable as sin. And many of them are on drugs. Friends, this is the wisdom of the world. This is what the world says will make you happy. You need to understand that human wisdom is all about personal fulfillment, pleasure, and happiness at any cost. Yet having tried all these things, Solomon's conclusion was that life lived according to human wisdom or under the sun is vanity or pointless. One writer has said, it's what's left after a soap bubble pops. That's all you're left with. Nothing. It will never satisfy, and ultimately it ends in judgment. So after he had done all of this, what was Solomon's conclusion? The wisest man who ever lived. Listen to him. The conclusion when all has been heard is this. Fear God and keep His commandments. Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The conclusion in life for Solomon, don't waste your time chasing after all these silly things. They won't bring you happiness. They didn't bring me happiness, he says. Instead, fear God and keep His commands. That's the command. Bitterness, jealousy, selfish ambition are all evidence of worldly wisdom. And this contradicts your claim to be wise. The fear of the Lord is an Old Testament way of referring to someone that lives in reverential faith, okay? It speaks of someone that knows God personally, has placed their trust in Him, and has proven their love for Him in a life of obedience. This is what it means to fear the Lord. Uh, a very interesting study sometime would be to go through the Old Testament and look up all the times the fear of the Lord is mentioned, and then compile all the verses and write down what they all say. It's a very interesting study. To genuinely fear the Lord is to be saved. And salvation is where wisdom begins in the believer's life. If you continue to live according to the wisdom of the world, the wisdom you have calls your faith a lie. That's what James is saying here. The wisdom that you are living by calls your faith a lie. So many people out there profess faith in Christ, don't they? I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe He died for my sins. But their entire life is lived after selfish ambition, vain conceit. Everything they do is for themselves. They have no love for God. They have no interest in what He has to say. They have no interest in following His commandments. They just want to do their religious duty. Go to church on Sunday morning. Maybe attend a Bible study during the week. Feel good about themselves. But the rest of the week, the rest of their life, they live according to their own selfish desires. Friends, that's not real Christianity. That's just dead religion. 
The fear of the Lord, it says in Psalms, is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who what? Do His commands. Well, again, we're talking about Hebrew wisdom here, not Greek wisdom. Hebrew wisdom. Those who truly understand, those who are truly wise, are the ones who do His commandments. Job 28, 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The Bible tells us time and time again, you can look up dozens of verses about the fear of the Lord. Time and time again, it talks about it. It's a deep, reverential trust in God. It's a desire to draw near to God. It's a desire to love God and obey His commands. This is what it means to be a person who fears the Lord. Secondly, firstly was motive. Secondly is origin. If the motive of worldly wisdom begins in the, is to do with the heart, the origin of worldly wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Three categories that were given. The wisdom of the world is in opposition to the wisdom of God. We know that. It certainly doesn't come from Him. So where does it come from? Where does this wisdom come from? The wisdom that the world lives by. Firstly, it's earthly. Now all this means is that life is only considered from the world's perspective. No thought is given to God. No thought is given to eternity. No thought is given to eternal judgment. That is all just simply eliminated from the conversation, right? Isn't that what you're taught in school a lot of the time? Those of you who didn't go to Christian school, certainly. You're taught that that's all there is. It's evolution. We're just a cosmic accident. There's no accountable, accountability to a creator. There's no morally right God out there who's going to judge you when you die. You just live life according to earthly perspective. And when you bring God into the argument, they get all upset. Because it messes everything up. Scientists don't really have a problem with creation as such. There's a lot of evidence for creation. I hope you realize that. Scientists have a problem with the implication behind creation. Because the moment you admit that there is a God who made the heavens and the earth, you become morally accountable to that God. And they don't want to be accountable to God. They love their sin. And they want to continue to do their sin. And live in sin. And the moment you say there is a God, you become accountable to Him. He owns you. He made the universe and everything that is in it. You belong to Him. And you answer to Him one day. And this is why the scientific community is so resistant to the idea of creation. It all comes back to accountability. No thought is given to God's perspective or the spiritual consequences of our actions. Now we all live in constant understanding of physical laws, don't we? I don't see any of you jumping off the side of CCF Center building, you know, just to see what it's like, all right? You know about the law of gravity, don't you? There are physical laws in place. If you jump off the side of the building, chances are you're going to die. Gravity will kill you really, really quickly when you hit the pavement, all right? There are physical laws. If I trip and fall off the stage, Chances are I'm going to hurt myself. Just the same as there are spirit, physical laws, there are also spiritual laws. And there are consequences for breaking them too. The earthly form of wisdom lives with incredible regard for earthly physical rules. But it lives with complete disregard for spiritual reality. No thought towards God. No thought towards His Word. No thought towards the things that He has said. No thought towards an eternal judgment. No thought towards heaven or hell.
Just simply enjoy your life. Do what makes you happy, right? That's how the world lives. That's earthly. Secondly, it's natural. While the world refuses to consider spiritual truth, the natural or unsaved man is unable to comprehend it. Now, this is important to understand. The term natural refers to the person that is spiritually dead. They are spiritually dead. They are separated from God. They do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. They are devoid of the Spirit, it says in Jude 19. And they do not have the Spirit, it says in Romans 8, 9. These are natural men and women who do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This kind of person lives entirely to please themselves and satisfy their own lustful desires. That's how they live. You ever wonder how some people you know live the way they do? They just move from one sinful mess to the next, don't they? Their whole life is a disaster. They move from one drunken party to another immoral relationship, and they never get any real joy out of it. It just makes their life more difficult. It makes their life harder. It brings more and more consequences that pile up in their life. They become more miserable all the time, and they just don't seem to get it. But this is natural man. He can't comprehend truth. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Earthly people, the earthly situation, they won't. They refuse to understand. The natural man can't understand. It takes the Holy Spirit to move in a person's heart and convict them of their sin. It takes God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, to turn on the lights before somebody will apprehend and understand spiritual things. That's why prayer must accompany the sharing of the gospel, right? While you are sharing the truths to them, you are praying that God the Holy Spirit will open their mind and give them understanding of those truths so that they will be able to put their trust in Christ, right? Have you ever sat there and given your absolutely best gospel presentation? All polished, every I dotted, every T crossed, every Bible verse in context in its perfect place. And the person sat opposite just looks at you as if you're nuts. <laughs> Have you ever done that? That's what Paul's talking about. The natural person who does not have the Spirit of God can't understand these things. That's why we need to pray. That's why it takes years sometimes of prayer. Of asking God to break through to a person's heart and mind. To give them understanding. Some of the times these people just don't have the understanding. You're sharing all the right things and they're not receiving any of it. Even the most educated among men and women cannot accurately evaluate mankind and solve its problems. Not at all. They have no divine wisdom. They don't know the truth. They don't want to know the truth. If the truth came up and slapped them around the face, they wouldn't recognize it. They can't. They're completely dead to it. There is nothing within them to latch onto it. That's where God comes in. God reaches down to sinners. God draws them to Himself, the Bible says. Convicts them of their sin. Shows them the error of their ways. Provides them with opportunity to repent and put their trust in Him. That's why you must never give up praying for your friends and your relatives. Never. Sometimes it takes many, many, many years for God to bring a person to the end of themselves and put their trust in Him. Thirdly, it's demonic. It's earthly, doesn't consider God at all. It's natural, has no capacity on its own to respond to truth, and it's demonic. Ultimately, worldly wisdom opposes God's interests and is aligned with the devil and his interests. We could say it is demonic thought influencing the fallen human desires that are found in earthly people, if you wanted to sum the three up together. In the end, the origin of the wisdom you live by will determine its outcome. 
Do you honestly think it looked wise to David to pick up a slingshot and take on Goliath? What would worldly wisdom say about that situation? You're stupid. You're going to die. Why would you do something like that? But God told him to do it, didn't he? So he did. And the rest is history. Friends, God's wisdom doesn't look like worldly wisdom. When God asks you to do something, when God makes it very clear to you from his word that this is the course of action you need to take, you need to take it. This is what we call divine wisdom. God reveals the truth. You, in an act of love and obedience, live that truth out in your life. And God takes care of the results. That's how it works. It's called living by faith. Lastly, the fruit of worldly wisdom. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Now this verse again, these verses on their own, they can sound a little confusing. But actually they make perfect sense. If your motivation is jealousy and selfishness, and you're always looking out for yourself, what will that produce? It produces factions and rifts, disagreements, right? And those things produce evil. So it's very simple. Jealousy and selfish ambition always result in disorder and every evil thing will follow. Now the Greek word disorder is very interesting, especially right now in the political climate, both here in America and around the world, right? Because it's referring to anarchy or political turmoil. Party politics, that's what it's talking about. Where does party politics come from? Why do we need different parties? Because people don't live according to God's wisdom. It's the wisdom of the world. It's my way. I did it my way, as the song goes. Right? You live that way, and you need political parties. All sorts of factions and divisions well up. Secondly, the word translated evil is actually the word in English translated foul. That means it is evil, it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's like a rotten fruit if you like. It's, it, it has nothing to commend itself to you. But it also has another dimension to the word where it talks about it being worthless, useless, no good for anything. And James is simply saying, if that's the path you follow, if human wisdom is the way you want to go, the result is what? Disorder. Factions. Disagreements. Clicks. And that will then turn into foul behavior, which does not accomplish anything good at all. These things are bad enough in the world, but in the church, they're a disgrace, right? It's bad enough in the world when you see that kind of wisdom. But when we see it in the church, and we see people in the church splitting into factions and divisions and fighting against each other and trying to destroy each other, that's terrible. And James is saying, if that's the way you live, if that's the kind of wisdom that dominates your life, you'd better reevaluate your faith and see if you really are a child of God. When a local church is filled with people that are full of themselves, the life and work of the church is under threat, right? It's that simple. In Revelation, God talks about taking away the candlestick. In other words, taking away His blessing from certain churches because of the way they were behaving. In the book of Revelation, the church at Smyrna was poor. Literally poor. I mean, they were destitute. Suffering. Great hardship. They weren't enjoying a lot of success. It was a small church under heavy persecution. If you ask them to evaluate themselves, they probably wouldn't have had a lot to commend themselves by. They would have probably said, hey, we're still here. We're hanging on. It's not easy. Some of us are in prison. Some of us are going to be burned to death. 
Polycarp, remember, was burned to death at Smyrna. Some of us are being fed to the lions. Every day is a challenge, but we're still here. We're still applying God's wisdom. We're still trusting Him. You contrast that with the church at Laodicea. It's rich, prosperous, enjoying great success. They thought they had God's blessing. But when God came into the situation and He made His judgment, He said the opposite was true. He said, Smyrna, you are a rich church. Rich. You have treasure in heaven you can't even comprehend. I love the way you're standing up for me. Some of you are really going to struggle. It's going to get really, really bad. But keep trusting me. It'll be worth it in the end, he said. To Laodicea, he said, you make me sick. That's what he said. He said, I spew you out of my mouth. You're like the polluted water that flows through the middle of the town. You're worthless. You're foul. You're not good for anything. How can I use you? You're a mess. You make me sick. You make me sad. I grieve over your situation. And that's where that famous verse comes in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, you find Christ outside the church. Wow. Wow. What a terrible situation. Worldly wisdom motivated by jealous zeal and selfish ambition will end in confusion and chaos. Disagreements, divisions, disruption, destruction, and divorce all follow this kind of wisdom. Why are marriages unable to be healed sometimes? Because you have two people who are only thinking about themselves. That's why. I trust me, any marriage can be fixed if that couple will surrender to godly wisdom. Any marriage. The most difficult part in marriage counseling is getting the two individuals to get past their hurts and get past their selfishness to a point where they start thinking about things from God's perspective and trusting Him. To do a work in the both of their lives. It's only selfishness that drives people apart. That's it. When it comes down to it. Why is there a division? Because you want one thing and they want another. Right? But if both of you submit to Christ, you'll be on the same page, right? And your marriage will improve. I'm not saying you'll necessarily have the perfect marriage. There's no guarantee of that. But I promise you, it can improve a great deal when you surrender it to Christ and you trust Him and allow Him to work. And in the church, we have all sorts of disagreements, don't we? We have so many divisions as people split up over different issues. We have a lot of disruption, different things going on that really when you put them into the Scripture's context, shouldn't even be happening. There's destruction as people seek to destroy one another and destroy one another's reputations. Marriages, families falling apart, all because they follow this kind of wisdom. Worldly wisdom produces nothing of any real value. It just keeps on producing evil thoughts, evil speech, and evil deeds. That's all it does. It just keeps harming people, harming you, harming me, harming the body of Christ, grieving the Holy Spirit. In our final two verses, James turns his attention to true wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. This wisdom in a true believer can be seen in three ways. Firstly, in his desire. Even though we struggle with sin every day in our lives, deep down inside, the true believer longs for holiness. Longs for it. Now, I fail just like the rest of you. I make mistakes. I say things I shouldn't say. I grieve over the sin in my life. But deep down inside, my heart longs for the day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns and takes me out of this sinful body and gives me a new body that has no desire to sin. I long for that day. 
I cry out for it. I cry out for it with tears on my knees. I beg God for it to happen. I want to be with Him. I don't want to sin anymore. Because that's the deepest longing of my heart. To be like Him. To never hurt Him again or anyone else. We came to Christ to be saved from our sin. In the Beatitudes, if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say? Because we hunger and thirst after righteousness. These are the people that are saved. We've been given a brand new heart and His Holy Spirit lives in us. Now let me show you this verse very quickly. This verse contextually is a promise concerning Israel. Okay? Ezekiel 36. One day, this will be accomplished in the nation of Israel. God will do this. He will give them a new heart. He will put His Spirit within them. He will save them. As it says in Romans 11, all those that survive the great tribulation, if you like, that, that's actually one-third of Israel. Two-thirds will die. But the third that survives will be entirely saved, every single one of them. Romans 11 tells us that. But this is a promise of the new covenant. And this is a covenant that you and I already enjoy. Okay? Israel hasn't come round to it yet because they still haven't accepted Christ as their Messiah. But one day they will, and this will happen to them as well. But the good news is, this has already happened to you and me. Jesus came, and He broke bread with His disciples, and He said, this is what? Of the what? The new covenant, right? That's what Jesus said. The new covenant has come. You see, the thing the Jews never understood is the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, those things could never be fulfilled on the other side of the new covenant. They had to wait until the new covenant had come to pass. When Jesus came as their Messiah and instituted the new covenant, He made the other things possible. And one day, we will see the fullness of those things. But in the meantime, while Israel still waits for their day, we enjoy this every day. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Is that not what's happened to us if we put our trust in Christ? I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. Now notice that. What will he do? Cause you. Motivate you. Push you in the right direction so that you will walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Now one day, this will be true of Israel when they return. But for now, it's still true of the church. We have a new heart. We have the Holy Spirit living within us who motivates us and moves us to walk with God. The only reason we still sin at all is because our new nature is imprisoned in our old body and fights against our old nature. Did you know that? If you didn't have the old body and you didn't have the old sinful nature hanging around, you wouldn't sin. That's the only reason. And one day we receive a glorified body, which the Bible tells us will no longer possess any capacity for sin. We call that our glorification when we go to be with Him. So that, essentially, is the desire that God puts within our heart. If you truly are born again, if you truly are a child of God, if you truly have been regenerated and made alive in Christ, there is a deep down desire for holiness. There is a deep down desire for righteousness. There is a deep down desire to please God. Now you may not do it all the time because you're constantly embattled by your old nature. But at the end of the day, when you fail, you grieve, right? And you grieve because deep down inside your desire is what? To please Him. Because you know that what you did is wrong and grieves Him. True faith goes to God's Word for wisdom and yields control to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us in order to see wisdom lived out in our daily lives. Not only have we been given a desire, 
but we're meant to have a dependence as well. If our faith is real, we will not only desire holiness, we will not only desire godly wisdom, but we will depend on God to see it worked out in our lives. It's called living by faith. We're saved by faith, we live by faith, and one day we will die by faith. The whole Christian life is about walking by faith. When we submit our lives to the wisdom of God's Word and yield control to the Holy Spirit, who is called the Spirit of Wisdom, by the way, in Isaiah 11 too, our lives will be filled with good fruit. It's not something you can produce on your own. It's something that God works in you. And we're given a little bit of a list. Now, each of these is a sermon on their own. I'm only going to mention it because our time is gone. But he says it will be peaceable. Now, this is peace-loving. Somebody who loves peace, but it's not peace at any cost. It's the kind of peace that God institutes. It still recognizes that sin is sin. So it's a kind of peace that goes to war on sin, but only so that it can rescue the sinner. Secondly, it's gentle. It's a gentleness without weakness. A sweet, beautiful, gentle spirit. It's been defined by Matthew Arnold as sweet reasonableness. It's actually, a number of Bible teachers say that that word gentle is the most difficult word in New Testament Greek to actually translate. It means so many things. Thirdly, it's reasonable. It's submissive, but it doesn't compromise. Submissive, but doesn't compromise. This is a concept that people in Asia need to learn. Okay? Really, honestly. Because too often I find Christian leaders lording it over other people, and every time they don't do everything they say, suddenly they're labeled as rebellious. No, we're meant to have deep convictions in our hearts about what the truth is. And we're meant to hold to those. Honor God first, right? But having honored God, we then honor our leaders, do we not? It's submissive, easily agreeable, but it doesn't compromise the truth. Merciful, it's controlled by compassion for others. It's filled with good fruits. It's faithful and fruitful. It's unwavering, single-minded, decisive, committed, consistent in the way that it lives. It's without hypocrisy. It's sincere, open, honest, and genuine. Not hidden behind a mask. Not fake. Not the Sunday Christian. Okay? The person who looks all good on Sunday morning, dressed up, but during the week has no regard for God at all. That's not divine wisdom. The fruit of divine wisdom is listed as these things. These are the things that will show up in our lives. Simply put, divine wisdom worked out in a person's life will look like Jesus, will it not? As we are conformed to His image, these are the things that become true of us. Now let me point this out, and I want to point this out again. And I need to keep pointing it out so that you get this. The point here is not that you will live this way all the time. All right? God understands that. James understands that. I understand that. Pastor Peter understands that. And I hope you understand that already. There will be times in your life when you make mistakes. That's why we're told in Romans 5, we stand in grace. We're not just saved by grace. We stand in it. The grace never leaves, okay? God knows you'll blow it. God knows you'll make mistakes. And there is grace when you do. The point is... If your faith is real, and you really do possess divine wisdom, these things will show up in your life. Divine wisdom will make itself evident in the way that you live, the way that you speak, the way that you think. The desire of your heart will be for holiness, even though you make mistakes. Your life will have a pattern of holiness to it, as you are conformed to the image of His Son. And you continue to make choices day by day that please God. Ultimately, there will be evidence in your life. Finally, the demonstration of true faith. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And you're probably all going, what on earth does that mean? Okay? It's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? It's very simple. 
As he closes this section, James points out that when we live according to God's wisdom, we sow righteousness and we reap good fruit. But good fruit only flourishes in a climate of peace. If it's in a climate of disorder and political factions, it won't happen. And that climate of peace will only happen when people make peace with each other. Simply put, you cannot have a harvest of righteousness if you sow in bitter jealousy and selfishness. If you live according to the wisdom of the world, the church will be filled with divisions. The church will be filled with destruction. It will be filled with difficulty. Families will split up. Divorce will be prevalent. Everybody will be divided. But if you live according to godly wisdom, you will become a peacemaker, will you not? Now let's go back to the Beatitudes again, the Sermon on the Mount. I told you we're going to be going back there. What does it say in Matthew 5, 9? Blessed are the... For they shall be called what? Sons of God. Reverse that. Sons of God are... Peacemakers. Friends, the Bible teaches this over and over and over again. If your faith is real, it will be seen in your life. The kind of fruit you harvest from your life proves what kind of wisdom you have. The kind of wisdom you have testifies to the kind of faith you have. When you come to Jesus Christ for salvation, He gave you a new heart, did He not? And that heart desires godly wisdom. Secondly, He's given you His Word as a lamp to guide you. And His Word is the revelation of God's wisdom. Thirdly, He placed His Spirit within you. And the Spirit of wisdom will teach and empower you to live in wisdom. And if you think you're lacking anything, James 1.5 says, Just ask Him and He'll give it to you. If you think you're lacking any wisdom at all, just ask and God will answer your prayer. It says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, he saved you who became to us wisdom from God. What is Jesus Christ? He is the wisdom of God revealed in human flesh. And if we claim to know Him, and we claim to listen to Him, and we claim to follow Him, what will be seen in our lives? The wisdom of God, right? We have a faith that works. It's resilient in trials. It's resisting temptation. It's responding to truth. It's vindicated by love. It's vindicated by works. It's manifested in speech. And it's manifested in wisdom. True faith works, friends. The question is, do you have true faith? Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? If He really is in you, it will be seen in your life. Unless, of course, you fail the test. 